Lonnie, welcome. It's good to have you back on Red and Blue. Thank you, Elaine. So I want to start with a topic that seems to be picking up steam after months of negotiations, and that is infrastructure. It now appears there could be enough Republican support to move forward on a bipartisan infrastructure deal, about $1 trillion over eight years. But progressives want the Biden administration to go for a much bigger plan, maybe up to $6 trillion. What's your sense, Lonnie? Do you think that a bipartisan deal could happen? I do think a bipartisan deal could happen. I think there is sincere interest on the part of the Republicans who've come forward to work with the president, to focus on physical infrastructure, to focus on some of the things that clearly our country needs. I hope the president can work in a bipartisan fashion. You know, going back to the campaign when President Biden was candidate Biden, he often talked about trying to break the political gridlock in Washington, trying to enhance the possibility for bipartisan compromise. This seems to be an opportunity to do that. And quite frankly, President Biden has already done a bunch uh, on the progressive side of the ledger. He's already gone big in a, in a couple of different packages uh, without Republican support. So having him uh, come over to work with Republicans on an issue that should be bipartisan in nature, uh, I think would work to his advantage. And by the way, I think it works to Republicans' advantage as well to have something they can point to to indicate that they work together to solve a big problem. So let me ask you a bit more about that. So some Democrats are concerned that Republicans are keeping negotiations going but may not end up getting on board with the eventual bill. And they point to a somewhat similar situation during talks for the Affordable Care Act under President Obama. But do you believe that Republicans actually do want to work with Democrats? Because politically to some, it wouldn't appear that there'd be much benefit to giving President Biden a bipartisan political victory. Yeah, I think health care and infrastructure are very different issues, Elaine. I, I can see why there'd be skepticism about health care, even though I personally have advocated for and have talked about ways that Republicans and Democrats can work together on health care. I think infrastructure is a different issue. I, I think with infrastructure, mm -hmm. there is a win-win here in the sense that Republicans can go back to their districts and say, listen, I voted for a package of reforms that got such, you know, some amount of money or some reform or some kind of infrastructure into a particular district or state. Uh, I think the parochial views of members of Congress in that sense would drive them to want to support a bipartisan deal. So I, I tend to think it could work in the favor of both President Biden as well as many congressional Republicans to work together on infrastructure, probably not the same on some other issues. I can understand why mm -hmm. there might be greater skepticism in other ways. But on infrastructure, it's something everybody talks about as a potentially bipartisan issue. And I think we're seeing some of that come to fruition now. All right. Well, let's talk about health care. The Supreme Court just threw out Republicans' third challenge to the Affordable Care Act. The 72 margin is wider than previous cases, even though the court has gained conservative justices. What do you think went wrong? Well, look, I think there's a couple things. First of all, on the sort of legal and technical issues involved in this case, uh, I think the answer was pretty clear. Uh, I think when the justices first heard the case, uh, they, they heard the case and there was a lot of skepticism, I think, in their questioning, in the kinds of arguments that were being put forward by those who wanted to strike the ACA in its entirety. So I never really saw this as a serious legal challenge. I do think it's interesting, Elaine, by the way, that you had a number of conservative, uh, more conservative justices, people who um, the Democrats had campaigned against during their confirmation processes, people like Amy Coney Barrett, the most recent addition to the court. Mm -hmm. She actually voted to, to effectively save the ACA. So some of those arguments ended mm -hmm. up being hollow. I think going forward, the challenge for Republicans is going to be the Affordable Care Act is the law of the land. It has been the law of the land now for many years. Um, I think Republicans would be best served thinking about what are the specific policy solutions they can put forward to address some of the health care challenges we still have. We still have a system that is too costly. We still have too many Americans who remain uncovered. Those are the kinds of questions to be focused on as opposed to narrow questions about, you know, what do we do with the ACA? I think basically most of the ACA, if not all of it, is going to be here to stay. And I think the question becomes, how do you uh, behave and how do you legislate constructively in this context? So, OK, with that in mind, then, what does the Republican health care pitch look like, you think, after close to a decade of trying to, quote unquote, repeal and replace Obamacare? I think there's two things, Elaine, I would focus on. The first is I would look carefully at health care costs. 
and that extends to issues that are not just you know strictly within the confines of the ACA, but more broadly, what are ways to promote greater competition in the healthcare marketplace? What are ways to ensure that monopolistic behavior isn't going on, particularly amongst some healthcare providers that probably has driven up costs? What are some of the ways to address questions around prescription drug pricing, which has been another major issue? And then what are ways that we can, in general, use technology to make the system both work better, but also make it uh, less costly as well? So I would focus certainly on cost. The second thing I would do is I would look carefully at state-based innovation. This is something we've seen a number of states over the last couple of years in the absence of more activity and action from Washington, D.C., more and more states have gone to state-specific kinds of reforms. We have seen this, for example, in states like Minnesota and Alaska, where they have tried to create programs, for example, to help cover people who have pre-existing conditions and who can't afford their health care coverage still. We've seen efforts to expand the Medicaid program selectively in some of these states. So I think that there are ways to get to the health care question that don't involve a big federal answer. And I think Republicans should really focus on those efforts and promoting those instead. Well, I want to turn to a topic now that is generating a lot of headlines, especially in conservative media, and that is the concept of critical race theory. It is an academic framework with roots dating back to the 1970s, and it's focused on the idea that racism isn't something only demonstrated by individuals, but that institutions and systems in the U.S., like the legal system, for instance, have racial inequality built into them. Well, now at least eight states are banning the teaching of critical race theory in elementary in high schools, even though it's an idea more commonly found in, in colleges and law schools. But, Lonnie, why do you think this has become such a big focus for Republicans right now? I think it's part of a, a bigger set of concerns that Republicans are reflecting uh, in many parts of the country, which is that you've got people who don't necessarily want uh, you know, particular types of instruction or don't necessarily want a particular way of thinking to be taught as the, quote, right way of thinking in schools. Ultimately, these sorts of issues, I think, are local issues. They should be resolved at the local level, and they should be resolved in discussions at local school districts. And in fact, you're seeing that. You're seeing this conversation mm -hmm. happen in school districts and in localities around the country. Um, the reality is also that a lot of these different types of theories are things that are taught at the collegiate level. They are very much a part of legal education now. They were part of legal education even when, when I went to law school. So um, I think as mm -hmm. people get on, as students progress in their academic careers and they have a little more intellectual maturity, they have a little bit more of an ability to decide what they would like to learn about and what not to learn about, my sense is that that is comparatively less controversial than saying we're going to take a particular doctrine and mandate this as the right doctrine across a whole broad swath of students. I think that's what you're seeing some resistance to. Uh, and also more broadly, I think there are a lot of conservatives and as well as independent minded people around the country who, who feel like the limits of progressivism are beginning to be reached. And in some ways, this critical race theory conversation is an analog for that debate. It's an analog for that feeling that maybe they're coming up against uh, a little bit too much. And so, you know, I think you're hearing that and seeing that reflected in debates all across our country. Is it fair to call this sort of another or the latest front in the culture wars? And, and if so, is adopting this position that some conservatives have, um, is that a winning strategy, you think, for Republicans? Yeah, it is, I think, part of a set of discussions around cultural issues, but it obviously touches things that are that are much more directly related to, to, to many families on a day-to-day -day basis, like education. We've talked about this already. What are the things kids are learning in schools? I think that is a kitchen table issue that a lot of families around the country wonder about. Whether it's a wise political strategy or not, we'll have to see. Uh, again, I think more broadly, Elaine, there are some concerns about the far reaches of progressivism and the degree to which that has come into the mainstream. Uh, to the extent that you have critical race theory as a part of that conversation, I think it, in that sense, it, it is something legitimately to be brought up. I think there are people, you know, the so-called suburban moms that were a big part of the Democratic coalition in 2018 and 2020. Are they going to continue to be responsive given issues like critical race theory, like defunding the police? Some call them cultural issues. Uh, I think mm -hmm. more reasonably they're described as quality of life issues. 
And I think that's something that we're going to see a discussion about, uh, again, at the local level throughout our country. Lonnie, we're also seeing state Republican lawmakers push for more 2020 election audits as we see Arizona's nearing a close. And these audits started in states former President Trump lost, but now they're extending to states he won. And we've yet to see any evidence of widespread voter or election fraud. So what do you think the objective is in pushing for these audits? Well, you look, I think some of it is political. I think some of it is, you know, people who are frustrated with the, with the outcome. Uh, you know, regardless of what the motivation is, I, I guess my advice or what I would say is let's look forward, not backwards. Uh, let's figure out ways to make, uh, you know, for those who are Republicans and conservatives, that message more appealing to more Americans. That ought to be the focus rather than, than a backward looking analysis of what happened, um, you know, particularly in states where the margin wasn't, wasn't all that close. I'm just not sure that that's a productive use of time as opposed to what the alternative is, which is articulating a vision going forward that can be attractive to those voters who didn't vote for Donald Trump or didn't vote for Republicans in 2020. Uh, I think that ought to be the focus as opposed to uh, looking back at the past and trying to nitpick on one thing or the other. Uh, I think it's just a less productive use of people's time. And frankly, at the end of the day, it's not going to reveal a whole lot of illustrative information, I think. How possible do you think that really is, though, in actuality, to kind of maintain the focus forward when you have, you know, former President Trump continuing to weigh in, he's going to be traveling and, and holding rallies? I mean, to be successful in today's Republican Party, do you think that politicians are essentially required now to align themselves with former President Trump and his grievances over his election loss? You know, I would hope that um, Republican office holders and candidates and, and advisors around the country can recognize that the conservative movement and the Republican Party has always been strongest when they're looking to add people, not to subtract people from the coalition. And one of the concerns I have about a strict allegiance to everything President Trump says and does is that that's not necessarily a, a formula for that. It's not a formula for adding people. It's almost saying, look, uh, you know, we can only add people if we we can only add to our numbers if we become more exclusive and not less exclusive. That's just not a message that I particularly find resonance with. So I, I hope that that's not the direction the party is headed in. I don't think it is, Elaine, by the way. If you look at public opinion polling since the election, uh, it's become clear that people are adopting a broader view of what it's going to take for the Republican Party to be successful in the future. And it's not just about allegiance to President Trump or to President Trump's views. Look, is he an important figure in the Republican Party? Of course he is. He's the past president. He's somebody who has a huge following. A lot of people uh, were brought into the political system because of their support for Donald Trump. So those are our folks and those are voters who the Republican Party wants to include in a coalition just as much as those people who believe in core values and tenets of conservatism, but who maybe weren't as high on Donald Trump. So I think the Republican Party succeeds when it creates a broader tent to participate in. And that's really got to be the focus, I think, going forward for the party. All right. I want to turn to your future, Lonnie, because you are considering a run for controller in California. That is the state's chief financial officer. Why are you considering running for that office? Well, you know, I've, I was raised in California. I've been in California for some time. Um, there's a lot of great things about this state, but there are many challenges as well. And I think one of the biggest challenges is the lack of transparency and accountability for how taxpayer money is spent. These are really serious issues. I know they're a little wonky, maybe. They seem a little technical. But that really is, I think, the root of many of the challenges in terms of us having all sorts of programs to deal with homelessness and housing costs and business environment. But for some reason, those are still problems we're not solving. And so what the controller can do and what I hope to do if I jump in and, and pursue this is to actually have a rigorous data-based approach to saying, what are we spending our money on? Are we getting our money's worth? And making sure that there's accountability to California taxpayers if that is indeed uh, kind of the office that I'm able, able to win. So um, it's, it's an office that I think it can be uh, very impactful one that can have a huge measure of impact on the lives of Californians. And, you know, that's why I'm looking at it very seriously and think that I would have something to add to that conversation. 
So let me ask you a bit more about your personal background, because this is not something we get to talk about in our typical conversations. You are the son of immigrants from Taiwan, born in North Carolina, as I understand it, raised in Los Angeles County. You have four degrees from Harvard, in addition to the political resume that we outlined at the top. How do you think that your background has shaped your political views? Well, you know, um, I am the son of immigrants, and I think that immigrant mentality is a is a big part of how I view both opportunity in America, but also kind of where we are right now. Um, you know, I was raised believing that in America you could accomplish uh, anything you wanted to, so long as you played by the rules and you took advantage of the opportunities given to you. Uh, unfortunately, for a lot of people today, those opportunities aren't available. And so we need to do more to ensure that they are more broadly available. But this immigrant mentality of working hard, playing by the rules, uh, ensuring that you're, uh, you're looking at what's in front of you and trying to achieve based on what you've been given and what you've earned, I think those are things that are broadly resonant with the American story. And they're things that, whether your, your heritage is from Asia or Latin America, or Europe, or Africa, um, you know, there is some similarity to that. As I talk to others who come from immigrant backgrounds and those who've been in America for many generations, there are things that people can come together on. And I, I wish there was more of that, because I remember a time when I was growing up that it felt like we were a lot more united as a country around, you know, any number of different issues. And today, I know we're, we're so divided. Um, and, and that, I think, is unfortunate. Um, we are so divided. Um, we are at a time of uh, reckoning on many fronts as a nation, um, including a racial reckoning. And it occurs to me, Lonnie, you are coming to us, obviously, there from California and Mountain View, not far from Oakland and San Francisco. Those are two places that have unfortunately seen an uptick in violence against members of the AAPI community, Asian American Pacific Islander community. We know that President Biden signed into law the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act recently. Recently, he has also appointed Erica Moritsugu as the AAPI senior liaison, a position that did not exist in the White House and the West Wing before the Biden administration. I wonder what your thoughts are on that, given what we have seen in this uptick in attacks against AAPI people. Yeah, I mean, these attacks are heartbreaking. Um, they're angering uh, to those of us who see. Uh, our neighbors and our friends who are being assaulted and attacked for no other reason than for their background, their heritage. Um, you know, look, it's something that at the national level, obviously the attention has increased on it. And I think, you know, that's a good thing. But a lot of this is, is going to have to stop and be enforced on the local level. We're going to have to see our mayors and our county supervisors and our state legislators and our governors get much more engaged. You know, I was i um, really proud to co-author a piece with Larry Hogan, the governor of Maryland, uh, after the Atlanta spa shootings, uh, basically saying that so much more needs to be done at all levels of government to address this challenge. And it, it is about letting people know and see and understand the challenge. It's about ensuring we're keeping the right data, which uh, the COVID-19 uh, hate bill that was passed, that, that incorporates some of that. So all that's good and it's important. But in my view, it's about leadership. And it's, a, it's very important for the Asian American community to recognize that having a voice, having a seat at the table, means stepping up and demanding to have that seat, demanding to have that point of view represented. And you know, as part of the reason why, to our previous conversation, I've been thinking about running for this office, because I do think that uh, having a seat at the table is remarkably important. Representation is remarkably important. And, and so there's so much more that needs to be done. It's not just about what the Biden White House does or what the people in Congress do. Uh, it's incumbent upon all of us in our communities to continue to shed light on these issues and to do our part to make change. Back on your potential candidacy, Republican statewide victories are rare in California, as you well know. There has not been a Republican state controller there for 46 years, since 1975. Lonnie, what exactly is the path to victory, you think, for a California Republican? Well, we also haven't had, a, I'll add something to make it even worse. We haven't had a statewide elected official at any uh, office, any of the eight elected offices since 2006, since the election of Arnold Schwarzenegger as governor and Steve Poisner as insurance commissioner. So w we've got to do a couple things. And, you know, if I get into this race, I think I've got to focus on a couple things. The first, the first thing is really articulating uh, a vision and specific ideas 
for what I want to do and why voters should give a Republican a, a chance in this case. And I, I think a big part of that is explaining to people that for this office in particular, it's not about ideology, it's about competence. And I think that's something that people resonate with. When I talk to Californians here, they're frustrated that the state can't seem to get basic blocking and tackling right. We can't just figure out what our state's spending money on. We can't just figure out how to stop. We had a massive fraud in our unemployment insurance system here that could have cost taxpayers up to $30 billion. Things like that are very basic issues that when I talk to Republicans and when I talk to Democrats, the frustration is the same. So it's about a message. It's about an, a set of ideas. And it's helping them understand who I am as well. So I think there is a pathway there. I think it does involve, again, presenting ideas, presenting them earnestly, and then having a real discussion and a debate. And if I get in, I'm, I'm going to be happy to, to have all those things and to do my best to present my perspective, my ideas, and my point of view, and, and ultimately let the voters decide. Very quickly, Lonnie, if you get in, should we consider that the formal start of your career as a politician? Well, you know, politician's a, a dirty word in some households around the country. <laughs> um, I, I prefer to think of it as it's a different phase of my career, something else where I'm trying to figure out how I can contribute to make sure that my kids grow up in a California and in America um, that gave opportunities in the same way that they gave my parents when they came to the United States uh, 40 years ago and, and that, I, that I've had through my life. I want to make sure that we continue to, to, to pass those on. So. Uh, I, it's not about politics. It's about how I can impact this conversation. And if I get in, it's going to be because I believe that's the best way I can do it uh, and continue to, to be effective in this, uh, in this very important set of issues that we've been talking about. Lonnie Chen, thank you so much for joining us, Lonnie. Thanks, Elaine.